Welcome one and all to the Ferret and Raccoon podcast, episode 229. I'm the Indigenous Owl. I'm the Angry Raccoon, bringing you the last podcast of October 2023. And given the fact that we've done three podcasts this October, it's uh, a long time coming, especially because we've got somewhat of a special kind of making up for the lack of spooky content of the last two <laughs> ones. Um, I brought up the big guns because obviously I'm here with Owl on this episode. Yeah, it's good to be back. It's been a while. The last podcast I believe you were on was 220. Okay, right. So it's so been it's a little while. Bit, but, yeah, a little while, yeah. You know, so let the people know what you've been up to since the previous podcast you have been on. All right. So the main things that I've been up to, so in terms of films, I've gone to see um, the first Slam and Dunk. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so that came out like in the late August. Um, I absolutely enjoyed it. And I knew absolutely nothing about the anime. I was a completely just gobsmacked about the whole film. I was just like, okay, I, I went into it expecting absolutely nothing at all, and not expecting much from it. I was thinking, I'm not going to enjoy it. It's probably going to be a, like a, just a sport anime. Uh, I'm not really into basketball, but absolutely enjoyed it. It's, it played as like a prequel slash sequel, so it went a bit into like flashbacks about the main character and how he grew up, and um, then it kind of it went back to the current position where they were and in the basketball match but it just it some of it was so intense because it's like you were kind of like me and my friend when we went to go see it there was a point where but because it was it's a shame because it wasn't just two of us in there there was two other people in the screening with us we wanted to like like like, you know you're just screaming like come on come on but we couldn't do it so we had to silently cheer we're like come on well that's how you know you're watching something good (laughs) yeah it was so good i really yeah we both really enjoyed it and we both knew absolutely nothing or uh, at all about it um, the next thing I watched in cinemas was um, uh, Some Motherhood, which is basically a, well, it's a quote unquote sequel to Anotherhood, which is a parody of like the original films that came out back in, so I think the first fil- film, Kid Hood, came back in 20, no, 2007. So basically Anotherhood came out in 2011, 2010, and it's basically a parody of those films. Um this film, Some of Hood, was a massive disappointment because it unfortunately used a lot of jokes from Another Hood, which, yeah, you don't really want to just go to a film and hear the same jokes from the original film. That was 10 years ago. You... So, like, literally the same jokes or were yeah. they, like, similar? No, it's literally the same jokes. And, like, I'll, I'll use an example of the film. So, um, one of the characters. So, in the original film, they had, like, a crackhead. And they had another crackhead in this film, but basically um, they had the crackhead do exactly the same thing, played by different people, do exactly the same thing as the crackhead in the original film back okay. 10 years ago, which is just like, really? Are you actually going to do this? And then, you know, you had the randomly, like, Jeremy Corbyn was in this film, and it's just like, oh, he's in it. And it's like, oh, that person's in it. Guest starring. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it, it just felt, yeah, it felt, and all the humour felt forced as well. So it was just like, oh dear. God, it is. it started getting a bit over the top at the end, and like, the experience itself at the cinema wasn't great because like, um, so like we had an empty screening. It was quite, like quite a few other people, but there was a lot of like empty rows, but it was so annoying because like these idiots like decided to sit right behind us and they were kicking our chairs the whole time. It was so annoying. And how old and were they? they? They were like, they're pro- I think 18, 19 year olds. Really? And you're acting yeah. like a child? Yeah. It was just like, ugh. I mean, I felt like it was worse than my Super Mario experience, honestly. Jeez. <laughs> and we all know about what happened there. <laughs> yeah, we all know. Um. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the two films that um, I've seen so far. Um, in terms of like games, I've actually recently picked up um, Dragon Quest Nine that came out on the Nintendo DS. Oh, so yeah. I've been playing that quite a bit. I've, on the DS? Or? Um, yeah, on the DS. Okay. Yeah, original DS. Um, I, yeah, my friend got me into it and... Um, yeah, it's my first Dragon Quest game that I've actually played. Um, I did, I like watch like Obsidian play Dragon Quest on PS2, but um, I didn't actually play it myself until like just recently. And I'm really enjoying the game. Um, literally, you get to like create your own um, characters, and you get you have like all these different classes. So you have like warrior type, priest, mage, um, martial artist, and you can pick like um, pick whichever class your characters can be. You can have a maximum of four members on your team, and then it's basically like um J, uh, jrpg so you're just grinding and then basically facing um facing monsters and like leveling up your characters and that kind of thing i i really enjoyed it i didn't expect much from the game but 
so far, I'm, yeah, I'm actually hooked on the game. Good to hear. Good to yeah. see you've um, uh, got into that quite hefty series. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them, I think, ports were actually on the DS. So yeah. And there's like maybe three or four more you can get, and then I think there was some on the DS. Yeah, one was that's I think right. a remake as yeah. well, kind of. But yeah, and I know um, the newest one. I'm not sure. Was it like 11 or? I think yeah, I think it's 11. Yeah. That got like I think it was on like Wii U, and then yeah. it's on like Switch, and I think it's on like every yeah, it's on console. Switch now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which is you know fair enough, I guess. But um, is that it for you for the most part? Um, I know. Actually, I'll briefly talk about MCM Expo yesterday as oh, well, yeah. which I mentioned. Um, so yeah, I went to MCM yesterday and um, still expanding on the topic of Dragon Quest. So we did go around a couple times and we kept coming back to the same stand because one stand um, literally had, it was just like dedicated to Dragon Quest and Vocaloids, which is like really random, but two, it was like... Two of your things, yeah. granted one of them is a newer thing. That yeah, you know, like. and it's just like... <laughs> How like like how is this even? I've never seen it at any convention before, but just specifically Vocaloids and Dragon Quest. I just I loved it, absolutely loved it. We had, like we went around at least twice. It's like we're not interested in anything else here because like we did see like other stands as well, but they mainly had like um um well Band Presto's like a good company for figures and stuff, but and because they're more cheaper and more affordable. But like all the characters were just more main like mainline anime, mainstream anime, so like Naruto, Bleach, De- Demon Slayer, that kind of stuff. So it was n- not really much obscurity going on there. But mm. this one just felt obscured, it felt perfect, and I was just I literally actually said to the woman like, "You got the best stand here." I literally had to come back to her twice because of how great the stand was. High praise. Yeah. Hopefully they'll be there next time though. Yeah. I hope so as well. well. Hopefully they start some kind of company, even if it is like a somewhat niche yeah, yeah. <laughs> product they're selling, I guess. <laughs> but no, that's good to hear. Yeah, I was meant to go um, to the MCM Comic Con, but I just didn't have time. I think I was too busy focused on uh, other things for the most part. But um, I didn't do too much other than just kind of back and forth between several games. I think everyone, if you're a gamer, it's a good time to be a gamer right now because there are so many good games out right now. Granted, yeah. there's some not so great ones. I mean, every now and then you get another Gollum-esque type game. <laughs> I know the new King Kong game came out and that one is not great. But um, obviously everyone's either <laughs> playing Super Mario Wonder or Spider-Man 2 or Alan Wake 2, which just released. Um, I've been playing a few things, as I've said. But the one thing I did do, which is something I've never done before, and I actually went to my first comedy show. Oh, And okay. I went to the comedy club Up the Creek to see comedian Mo Gilligan. Oh, okay. Um, in his work in progress I guess, show or tour, which was really fun. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention the supporting act, which was a comedian named uh, Josh James, who came on before him. Okay. He was not a comedian I wasn't, like, too familiar with beforehand, but um, I guess a lot of people must know him because literally a couple of days ago, he was on uh, the newest incarnation of Big Brother. So clearly he's getting up there. uh, That's really good. So props to him. He was really good. I really liked how he kind of worked off, like, his actual set and Mm. kind of... Almost, almost made fun of, not necessarily his amateurish like um, intentions. Like for example, he, you know, as one of his starting points, he was like, "Is anyone a builder?" And it was complete silence. He was like, "Right, okay, moving on." <laughs> but then he made a joke, kind of talking about um, religion, and he was like, "Yeah, it's funny how I get a big uproar from religion, but not from builders." Interesting that. Um, but he was really good. I really liked his set, and obviously Mo Gillen came up for, I think, over two hours. He was on. Oh my god, which was amazing. And yeah. now. I'm not going to spoil any of the jokes or any of the stories he tells from that because it is a working progress show. And he said a lot of the stuff that he talked about there may end up in his uh, world tour, which he goes on yeah. next year. So I won't spoil too much of it, but I really did like how it was more narrative driven. He talked a lot more about like where he currently is and what he's currently doing. Oh, nice. And a little okay. bit more kind of going into his past and his kind of growing up in that kind of sense. It got very relatable to some extent because he's not too old. He's about 35 years old. Mm. And we're roughly kind of that age range. So there's a lot of things I think a lot of people are like, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Mm. Especially when he kind of talked about like school days. And I was like, oh, yeah. oh gosh, yeah, I remember those days um, to some extent. Especially when he's bringing up Nutmeg Rush and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, what was great as well was he kind of ended the show with a Q&A, which is really informative because people asked him like how we first met Big Nasty, who obviously does oh, the yeah, co-host yeah, with Nasty, the Big Nasty yeah. show. Um, which is really funny because he portrayed Big Nasty to be like a very... Um, almost like showboaty kind of character that's oh. full of lies to some extent. <laughs> Even to the point which is a nice exclusive where Big Nasty apparently se- te- um, sends Mo a lot of random mes- voice messages. Yeah. And Mo Gilligan actually played one of the messages. <laughs> I'm not going to say what he said because yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you after. But 
it was quite funny and quite nice to have that. But it was really nice to have him kind of go a bit more into personal details, especially because someone asked, is he going to do more um, bedtime stories? Yeah. He unfortunately said he's not going to, which Aww. is a shame because I think he literally said it was during COVID. I had plenty of time. Oh, and yeah, of course. Yeah, in his own yeah. words, I just can't be fucked right now. <laughs> which. Fair enough. Fair enough. But it was a fantastic show. I'm looking forward to whatever he does next. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I'd highly recommend if you can catch him for the world tour or whatever. I think he, I think he's going to start in England and end in England. Oh, okay. So yeah, I think throughout the whole year, he'll be traveling around the world and then the last few days will be in England. So Definitely highly recommend going to see Mo Gilligan. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty much the main event stuff I did. But we've got another event to talk about. Our first topic. And that's a uh, very interesting one. Uh, Doing doing something a little bit different. We're somewhat reacting and kind of discussing uh, an interesting sight. An interesting scene, uh, so to speak. And um, it comes across as very random. So we're just going to get straight into it. So... There was an early screening of the Five Nights at Freddy's uh, film, which I think comes out quite soon. I think some people were optimistically looking forward to it. I don't know if it's going to be good or not. Yeah. And for whatever reason, uh, during the end credits of the film, a fight broke out in the cinema between a couple of people. And we have the footage. We've seen the footage. I'm going to link it in the description and download link. And yeah. Like, is it really that deep? I think yeah, it's the first thing we should discuss. True. It's just it's it's so random. It's just like how did it even break out? Like what even started it in the first place? It's like what they just did they have their theories on the film and they just thought nah like your theory was wrong and mine was right and they're just fighting over that or like, yeah, like what I don't understand is like how the hell does a fight even start in a dark room yeah where everyone is quiet and too busy occupied watching a film they paid ten pounds to see. Yeah. How does that happen? What was it like the moment you saw credits? It was like, fuck you, dude. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like what actually happened? Was someone kicking the back of his chair? Was someone for a popcorn at somebody? Like, I don't get it. <laughs> like, did these people wake up and choose violence this morning? Yeah. Like, what is going on? And I love the fact that they've turned their phones on in order to see yeah, the people sure it was. they're it fighting. Was that fighting. Yeah, it's a very brief funny. clip, but there's a lot of like key details you can like... I guess kind of decode from the video. And I mean, you can kind of tell the people behind them were kind of just like, oh my God. Like, Yeah, just, really? Or at the same time, a lot of them could have been very much like that Michael Jackson meme of him sitting in the cinema eating popcorn. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I probably would to some extent. It's, <laughs> it's a very surreal video to see a lot of adults fighting in the cinema as upbeat music plays. Yeah. It's so funny. Like seriously, don't start yeah. fights in cinemas. I was, I was, I thought it was when you showed me the video when you sent me the link. I was like, when I saw the video, I was like, oh, this must be in South London, surely. <laughs> but it's actually not even in South London. I was actually surprised. Yeah. Yeah, it's in West London. I was like, wow. Like if you told me that that was Peckham, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, apparently nah. I, I thought it was Peckham or something like that. But nope. That's just a default. Acton. Jeez, man. I mean, once again, it's not that deep. Yeah. It's it's. The Five Nights at Freddy's film. Yeah. Not unless you were like upset with the direction of it or something. Maybe, or, yeah. Maybe these people are hardcore FNAF fans. I don't know. But it, it, it seems just so bizarre. Yeah. I mean, have you ever witnessed an actual fight before? In, in well, not in a cinema or even a fight. Oh, oh no, I, I did witness one that was about to start, but then it stopped to like de-escalated quick. What, because the police came? Not even because the police came. It was just basically um, what happened was uh, one guy, he was cycling. And I think he almost hit the pedestrian. Mm-hmm. And then the pedestrian said, oh, yeah, like, you prick, basically. And then, like, the guy stopped his bike and he was like, come here, then, come here, then. And then it was just like, all right, I'm going to have a fight. And then everyone was just, like, about to circle and it just did not, it didn't escalate into things, you know? And they're just, like, verbally exchanging yeah. insults, but it's like they don't actually do anything. I see that. But, I've, only, yeah. I've only really seen one, kind of, when I was on the top of a bus. And I guess... These two guys must have seen two other guys they don't like on a bus. Uh, yeah. Got cha- ran the bus, well, not run the bus down. They ran after the bus, got on it, and started like insulting and fighting people. I I do remember one such insult they said to another guy, where they said, "I will wring this phone round your neck," which was just so bizarre. I, I was at the top, so I didn't quite see all of the fight, but I know at one point I think they just started involving some old lady. What? I don't know if she was caught in the middle of it or whatever, yeah. but I just distinctly remember hearing a lot of people say, "Leave the old lady out of this." <laughs> Now, was this in South London? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, to be. <laughs> this was. Not too far from where we're actually recording. Oh, God. But, um, yeah. And I, I, the, the funniest thing was, I think I was with my sister at the time. Mm. 
and I think we like most people we just noped out that situation I think yeah. I think someone called the police so they yeah. all ran and we got off and I remember this one girl who was in my school yeah. she kind of came off the bus and like kind of like walked into the arms of another boy in her class as if she'd been like assaulted or something and I was like fuck uh, off oh my days. you were behind us who yeah. were looking down on the fight like you're traumatized <sighs> And shame on that guy as well. Like, yeah, edu- like entertaining yeah, that kind of mentality. On. Anyway, we got some trailers to talk about, all spooky related, mm-hmm. which is awesome. I think you're going to give us the first one, Al, which yeah. is the first game one we have, or only game one, I should say. Um, so the first trailer that I'm going to be introducing is uh, Don't Scream. Um, I'm just going to talk about my thoughts on the trailer. It, it pretty much reminded me of White Noise that came out last decade. I can't lie the to film. you. Uh, no, the game White Noise. Oh, okay. Yeah, it came out like on um, Xbox. I think I think it came out on PS. I can't remember, but yeah, I just, I can't lie. I didn't really think much of the trailer when I watched it. I just yeah. I mean, it's a tricky one to some extent because, I mean, first of all, we want I want to say like jump scare warning really quickly. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna put it in the title of where I link it in the description down a link uh, about two minutes twelve seconds. There is a jump scare. I know some people don't like jump scares. Some people can't handle them. Mm-hmm. I think this one's quite egregious and it might upset some people. So I'm gonna put that warning there. I mean, it's basically the Blair Witch Project is I think what they're really going for it given the whole um, VHS um, HUD kind of element yeah. to it and. It's another one of those, like, realistic, like, games we've seen a few times before where it, like, really does a good job mimicking, I guess, real life, like, photorealistic Mm. stuff. And I think it's impressive in its own right how it looks aesthetically. Like, I think anyone who doesn't play games, if you showed this to someone who's never seen a video game before, they'd probably think it was real to some extent. But, um... It does look scarily real. I will give the game that. I think it does look cool. But if it's just a walking simulator, then that's boring in my opinion. Yeah, that's... Because yeah. you've got games like The Mortary Assistant, which was a very fun kind of like jump scare horror game, which did way more than this. And I would mm-hmm. say is a much scarier game than this. Yeah. Uh, despite this game having like a really nice and really cool atmosphere. There's points where, you know, it generally is kind of creepy. I, I think, you know, this, this whole idea of just being in like some forest and you don't know what's around and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um... All this game has to do, to some extent, is to scare you one time and you probably be, like, petrified for the rest of the game. Like, you'd be paranoid and on edge, Mm -hmm. which I think that can work in the game's favour if it's not just a, you know, all-out jump scare, you know, boo-haunted house kind of situation, which it kind of could be. I would, I really like the more subtle scares, you know, like, things just moving in the background and that kind of stuff. Um, This game... Yeah. And I was going to say, you know, hopefully it develops into a bit more than what we just, what we saw in the trailer. Yeah, hopefully hope there's more to it. I do. I mean, because it is dripping in atmosphere. Yeah. There are like visually some very striking shots and just some good use of like awful sound design in, in a good way. And that kind of sense. And I really do like that. And I was thinking when watching this trailer and I was like, imagine if a Silent Hill game started like this. That would be good. That'd be cool, but it's a shame the series is dead, so that will never happen. Yeah, sad times. Um, the one thing I did want to mention, which is something I've kind of been talking about a lot, and it's, it's interesting to see analog horror once again kind of make its way into mainstream mm. once again. And you really see it kind of hitting in a pretty big way where you've got obviously, what is it? You have the anthology series, the VHS series, which made a bit of a comeback on Shudder, where even some of those are kind of taking more of a analog horror-esque aesthetic you had um the backrooms game slash the whole mythos behind that which is obviously a very horrifying minimalist scary kind of concept you also have uh skinema rink mm-hmm. which is debatably one of the scariest films to date people are very hit and miss on this film it's either the worst film they've ever seen or the greatest <laughs> film they've ever seen i haven't seen it because personally it looks terrifying to me and i'm scared um <laughs> and uh, as well as elements of Five Nights at Freddy's technically had what this game has, this whole, you know, found footage camera VHS aesthetic. So That's true, it's, it's always yeah. present there. And it's kind of cool to see that because when you look at the subgenre that is analog horror, especially on YouTube, some of it is pretty scary. I would say that much. Mm. It's uh, it's really out there, especially when you get into an even sub sub genre, sub 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 genre yes. where yeah. um, there's people who are doing analog horror with prehistoric animals and dinosaurs and i'm like wow we are going places 
But we've got the next trailer kind of sticking with the uh, horror-ish motif. And then it's going to be Curses, which is going to be a DreamWorks animated film on Apple TV, okay. which is yeah. quite interesting. Never would have thought I'd see DreamWorks work with them. Not that I think they shouldn't. Um, but yeah, it essentially is going to be a fun premise. Seems like it's a family. They kind of live in this kind of spooky mansion. Mm. The dad's kind of been doing some stuff and the family's been cursed for whatever reason. And it's up to the kids and the mother to kind of break the curses, figure out what's going on. It is the good example of Boo Haunted House, where obviously I think most of the film and the story is going to take place. Oh no, it's this monster so got to run from the thing. You got to stop yeah. I think that's such a fun and great premise for something that is essentially a family friendly film in the most case. And I do like the fact that they're kind of going for that more cartoony cell shaded look with this one, kind of yeah. giving it more of a unique. It's very fitting especially when you kind of like combine it with like the harsh lighting and the shadows on their face kind of gives it that like you know when people put that torch over their face kind of gives it that look um the animation is a bit too stiff for my liking uh, unfortunately it kind of needs to be a bit more fluid i know they're trying to do it and animate it in like twos as opposed to threes so it doesn't have like a bit more of a stilted yeah um uh puss in boots two slash mm. Uh, into the Spider Verse, yeah, I kind of got kind that of vibe. Element. Yeah, yeah, I got that vibe from that. It actually. doesn't quite work here. I don't know if it's a budget thing because I think this is a smaller budgeted film because I didn't know about this. I only thought DreamWorks were releasing two films this year, but apparently they've got a third. Which you know, props to whoever made this because it looks great, and I, I imagine they've probably made it on a budget and in short time. So fair dues to them. But um, it, it's going to be one of those films. I think is just playful and just kind of fun. I hope yeah. it's not anything too crazy um in terms of it and it, it's just nice to kind of see something original from dreamworks that's more geared towards children because i know most animated films are quite universal and that adults can watch you know that i'm saying they can't not that i'm saying you have to put adult jokes in animated films in order for the parents to you know wake up from their slumber just to hear that one joke um <laughs> You know, but um, and also Robert England's going to be in this film. For those of you who don't know, he's the actor who played Freddy Krueger in the Nightmare on Elm Street films. Oh, right. So okay. he's got a voice in it. So I wonder if he's going to be the bad guy or whoever. So that's cool. Any thoughts on Curses? No, I didn't really have much to say on it. Just like pretty much what you said, pretty much. It seems like a fun family friendly film. That, yeah. Yeah. It's like, it feels original. I'm low key yeah. looking forward to it. I, I honestly hope there's going to be some nice surprises in terms of maybe twists or some of the monster uh, designs. Yeah. I'd love to see something just really crazy. Like the thing that's cursed them is like this demon or monster mm. that has like a really cool look. Yeah, yeah I'm kind exactly. of hoping we get some of that. Even not, I think it's still fun to have like, you know, monsters, goblins, clowns. Yeah. That's, that's still all in good fun. So I wanted to give this a shout out because not too many people talk about it, which I think is a bit of a shame. What's um, the little boy? Uh, he's it's voiced by the same voice actor did Miles Morales, right? Sounds sim- sounds similar. It might be. I'll have to yeah, check the credits. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, I have to check. Yeah, definitely maybe after the podcast Could or be, yeah. yeah. Uh, last trailer we have is going to be for Obituary, which is the last of the October-themed um, trailers. And I thought this was a kind of a cool premise. Essentially, it is a obituary writer or journalist. I can't quite remember what specifically she is, but she essentially writes and reports on crimes and murders. Uh, essentially taking upon herself to essentially murder people in order to give herself a job for the most part. <laughs> Which I think is a brilliant premise in a lot of regards because the lady herself, she kind of seems to be enjoying it. She doesn't, she's not coming across as a mental person. Yeah, no. Which I kind of like. And she also obviously has the smart to do it in a certain way. Like even in the trailer, she kind of talks about how like it's got to be done in a certain way or done in a way. Like she's doing it in a very professional way. Yeah. Which is why the series gave me a lot of like Twin Peaks slash uh, Dexter vibes. I was also going to ask you as well, Killing Eve vibes? Killing Eve... A little bit, actually. Okay. A little bit. Because I know you've watched that series. Yeah. And I don't know too much about it. And I was like, is this something people who enjoyed that show would like? Based on Maybe. what you've seen from it? Maybe. Okay. That's kind of one of the reasons I want to put it there. I do like the fact that it's based on the unfortunately funny and relevant concept of people always needing content mm-hmm. to write about. Yeah. And having to make said content. Uh, kind of relating to the fact how a lot of journalists, uh, more clickbait journalists, will just pick up the most random news story where it's like some Twitter account said some racist thing. We're going to run a story on this. He said he didn't like that. You know, it's kind of almost in the same vein where she's like, well, no one's being murdered. I guess I'll go kill someone, you know, and go write about it. And obviously she can go into great detail about who this person was because it's a very sleepy town. Obviously she would know a lot. And I think what would be great is what could be great about the series is that how she could make each kill more elaborate in order to kind of, 
you know raise the stakes and kind of like get gauge her audience's interest you know yeah. like oh, oh i really like it when you know not i really like it or she knows that she gets more of a reaction when people when it's an older person who gets killed or someone who's more beloved right. who gets killed yeah. especially if it's in more of a tragic or accidental way which i think could be a really cool um aspect to go on it as well as knowing that their you know their death or how they died can really bring out a certain emotion in some people but um do you reckon you'll watch it I think I will. I do like the premise of it. It's it's kind of cool. It does seem like one of those like low-key kind of like enjoyable shows. Mm-hmm. Like it seems like there'll be a bit of a mystery to it in terms of like some of the is she going to get caught or is anyone going to catch on to her? Because I mean, she does jokingly say, I guess I'll have to start killing people. Yeah. And I don't know whether or well, she says I'm going to have to start killing my boss. I don't know whether that's going to be, you know, because usually when it comes to stuff like that, it's you I guess it is kind of also working on the sense of it's usually the person you least suspect. Yeah. And maybe that's not, what she's working yeah, off as well. Maybe it's a little dark humour she's trying to use, you know, yeah, or something, yeah. You know, which is quite funny. And I, I do like the premise. I think it's a very original and simple concept. And I think we need more stuff like that because usually the simplest ideas are honestly the best ones. Uh, any thoughts on obituary? Um, not really, no. I just thought actually this looks like a, quite an interesting, um, it looks quite like an interesting show, really. Mm. Just a, mystery trying to figure out what is going on with these situations if it's going to be different case studies every every episode i'm not too sure but yeah seems like an interesting show for sure yeah i'm once again also looking forward to this one as well um that brings us to our discussion which uh we weren't able to do any halloween discussions because i didn't really have anyone on the episode but uh changing things up we're going to do two discussions this time and how you're going to introduce our first spooky season discussion all right. So the first discussion we're going I'm going to be introducing is uh, pitching horror slash uh, thriller TV shows that we've watched. So um, I'll start off um, with the first one with um, Tales of the Crypt. Okay. I, I really like. Uh, there's actually I'm not going to talk about the whole thing, but it's mainly like one episode that always stuck in my head, mm-hmm. which I cannot remember the name of the episode, but it's one where a woman she has like like a mask, a face mask on herself. Mm-hmm. And it's like set in like the kind of it's like set in the forest and you've got like a lot of like lumberjacks. Okay. But it's like she's kind of it's like she's mysterious because you're thinking like why is her face like that? Why is it is that her actual face or is that just a face mask that she puts on? Mm-hmm. And I think what it was I think like the twist at the end was like basically she oh, I can't even remember off the top of my head but I think she like basically kills people and uses their skin and wears their skin as like her face mask and it was just it always just stuck in my head it was just ugh, it was creepy but that's the, ep- the only episode that really stuck in my head I, overall I really loved Tales of Crypt but that was the episode that always got stuck in my head mm. to, the, to this day <coughs> it's an awful concept in a lot of regards yeah yeah uh, do you have any others you want to uh, mention and um, the other show that is um, I want to um, talk about is um, uh, Through Her Eyes which is more of a thriller show mm-hmm. so essentially um, the basic premise is a bit um, about a woman um, single mother and she I think she starts working in a job with um, a guy she she met at like a pub and they had like a one night stand basically and she ends up working in the same place as him and um, it kind of starts off, you're thinking, oh, okay, yeah, seeing, you know, seeing that in different shows and blah, but it gets really, really twisted because when um, the guy that she had the one night stand with is a married man and like she sees the wife, but the wife is like really strange. Like for some reason, it's just, you know, when so- you just know when you see a character and they're like, you, just something's really off about them and you're just yeah. wondering like why this person's like, like really... visually or personality wise. Yeah, just personality Both. wise. Yeah, okay. visually and personality wise. She All just right. looks really strange. But you find out like later on in the series, like what actually the backstory of what happened. Mm. I don't want to say it because it's a massive spoiler. I don't, I don't want like to ruin the show for anyone, but it's a very thought provoking and it does play with your head after you finish the show. It's really, really good. Reminds me a little bit of. Um... In the first VHS film, oh, okay. um, there's a story where um, this guy, because um, he's got like a camera in his glasses, and they kind of go out to get like girls and all that. Yeah. And they meet like this one just very odd lady. Yeah. And obviously they take some of the other girls back to the hotel to um, you know do whatever, and um, it becomes becomes very apparent there's something up with this girl. Um, I can't remember what that story is called. Everyone knows it because like the most iconic short in mm. all of um the vhs series but it single-handedly still has one of the scariest scenes i think i've ever seen to the point where it's legitimately horrifying um and it's a good example where it's like hey if a girl's acting weird maybe just don't take her home 
that's all I'm going to say. That's like kind of like the message of the story. Right, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, some of the shots in that short is just uh, truly horrifying. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take a slightly different approach with this discussion. And I'm actually going to pitch my own TV series slash... Yeah, TV series, horror thriller series. And I'm actually going to... Well, I'm going And this TV series is going to be called Horrorland. And it's going to be based on the 1994 Goosebumps book, One Day in Horrorland by R.L. Stein. Because for whatever reason, this is one of the only... Well, not really worlds. One of the only ideas that R.L. Stein, where he's really kind of expanded it several times next to like Night of the Living Dummy and stuff like yeah. that. Or Monster Blood, for example. And... <clears throat> I'll run through the base premise of the original story where it essentially follows a family who are looking for a certain theme park or amusement park and they're kind of lost and they eventually find this other one called Horrorland where all the people who work there are like dressed as like you know these like demon monster kind mm. of characters like, like horns like piercing yellow eyes and they decide hey we've never heard of this place let's go to this place and very quickly you kind of notice that something's kind of up with it like the rides seem just a little bit too mean just a little bit too horrifying in a lot of regards maybe unsurprising to a lot of people you do find out the monsters are actually real they are real monsters and they essentially are kind of messing with the humans in a lot of regards and i'm not going to spoil the exact ending and some of the other twists but you essentially the family manages to make it out of horror land kind of it seems that they're not super safe at the end of the story and my adaptation of this story is gonna essentially the first episode is kind of going to play out like the original book except what's going to happen is the family's not going to make it out of Horrorland. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of when the first episode is going to end. And then from there, Horrorland's kind of going to become like almost a wraparound narrative for other stories. Yeah. Where you're going to have other people who, you know, you're going to have like your typical Twitch streamers, TikTokers who are like, oh, I've heard about Horrorland. Let's go Horrorland. Oh, I heard it's spooky and haunted, you know, and all that. Like, you know, I, I love the visual of like people on TikTok filming these real monsters being like, oh, this costume is great. Look, this guy's super yeah. scary. You know, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, other people who, you know, as, as time goes on, tons of people start disappearing from Horrorland. Obviously, it gets people's attention. Some people go there actively looking for the people who have gone missing. Obviously, they meet their fate. And what I want to do, which is quite interesting, is I want to kind of show both sides of the situation where you're following both the human characters, both good and not so good, and the monsters, both evil and not so evil. Where, Because in the original Horrorland book, there are monsters who aren't evil. They don't actively want to hurt or kill humans. Um, So I kind of want to follow both sides where there's humans who are like, oh, I just want to find my friends and family. But then you've got other people who maybe more extreme examples where it's like, we're going to fucking kill these monsters, you know, that kind of stuff. Or the American government kind of going, yeah, something's up with this theme park. What is going on? Everyone we send there doesn't come back. Meanwhile, you also have like, the other powers that be in Horrorland who are like, oh yeah, this is great. We're just going to take over the world with this. Yeah. Um, in some sense where you have like almost like a revolutionary group of monsters. It's like, no, we don't need to do that. We don't need to, you know, that kind of stuff. So I kind of want it to be like both kind of fun thriller, but there's kind of going to be like some of the, the kills would be hor- horrible and that kind of stuff. That's kind of like my pitch for a TV series. So R.L. Stein, hit me up, give me a call. Yeah. Let's make this happen. Because I know he did... Um, he did like a small film anthology yeah. series of a couple of a few of his stories, which is kind of cool. It's like they're all named after years. I can't remember what they're called, but um, partly what um, Horrorland is based on is another story from the Channel Zero anthology series, mm. which is very underrated. Unfortunately, one of the people who worked on it has been outed as not having a good reputation. But um, the second season of Channel Zero um, has a premise where these people go to this touring kind of like literally boo haunted house kind of thing okay and the first episode is just downright chilling because it's a very elaborate setup where they kind of i don't know i can't remember what it's, it's I, I can't remember its name but it's the second season of channel zero and i think it's like no way house or something like that mm. and it's literally the the haunted house is literally a house like this tall black house that you enter and you go in and there's five levels you got to survive at any point you can leave but no one has survived level five no one has survived that like, can you know, the whole the part of the marketing is like can you survive level five like yeah. no one's got past it so obviously a group of people go in and you see like, these two girls and these they're like oh yeah we can do it and there's this one guy who bizarrely enough he's very prepared for this uh, haunted house he's got a backpack and everything he's super determined he's very cold to everyone he's like no no i'm, I'm just here to 
do what I need to do. Very odd guy. And there's another <laughs> characters who are a bit like, oh, yeah, it's going to be fun, whatever. <laughs> so they go to a lot of the floors and this, this, I'm not going to spoil all of it. There's some just generally just weird stuff that it starts to get weird where they can't explain it to the point where there's one room they get to and it's a room that just has sculpts of all their faces. Okay. And they're all looking at this going, oh, this is really cool. How the hell would they do this? And one guy's like, oh, they must have like scanned our faces when they came in. Mm. To which they're like, no, this is made of marble. Yeah, how's that possible? There's no way they could have done this. Like, this is a bit bizarre. And then the lights get cut. Mm-hmm. And the lights come back on. And all the heads have changed. I'm not going to say what the heads look like. I'll let you see that. But it is unsettling what happens. Is this animated or... Oh, it's a live action series. Live action series. Oh, and okay. uh, yeah. And eventually it gets to the point where a couple of people leave. And I think the, the main characters... They, get, they manage to make it to level 4 and they decide, no, too much. And they get out. They manage to get out just before level 5. And they come out and they kind of all that. And um, yeah, let's say let's just say the series continues. Or, I, or, or to not to spoil too much, not is all is not as it seems, unfortunately. And that's where the series continues. It's a really good series. Everything from Channel Zero is fantastic from... Because they're all based on creepypasta stories, I believe. Okay. So the first season was uh, Candle Cove, Mm -hmm. which is based on this idea of this really weird, creepy TV show that gave people nightmares. Mm. The third season I know was called Butcher's Block, which was very, it it dealt with um, mental illness, which was quite interesting. Okay. And the third season was basically like a weird Stephen King story where this, without spoiling too much, this girl, she finds a door in in the house she moved in and only she can enter it and something comes out of that door. Something comes out of that door and it's kind of horrifying a bit. But um, I won't spoil too much. It's a fantastic series. I highly recommend. If you if you want something that's actually generally quite creepy and quite spooky, I'd highly recommend that. Okay. Um, we've got a second discussion, which is going to be us talking about characters that scared us who may or may not have been scary in general, I guess you could yeah, say, general, for the most yeah. part. Would you like to go first or shall I? Because I've can got go first. a few. Okay. Yeah, so go. I've only got to mention one show, four-letter show, Courage the Cowardly Dog. Oh! <laughs> Where do I start with this series? <laughs> we we could do a whole podcast just on this series. Oh, absolutely. I would actually be down for that. And I was thinking just the other day, it is such a fantastic and brilliant series when you think about it. Even just thinking about how, not necessarily relevant, how ahead of its time it was. Mm. When you think about the computer that Courage had. Yeah. Because he had a computer in his... I, sh- I probably should mention, because there may be younger people who've never watched Courage Cowardly Dog. Essentially, it was a two- early 2000s animated series that revolved around Courage. A, um, I didn't actually know he's a beagle. I didn't know he's a beagle dog. Oh, um, right. Okay. <laughs> a beagle and his two elderly owners, uh, Eustace and Muriel, who live in literally in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and spooky things happen. And the story kind of revolves around courage, kind of ironically having to build up courage despite yeah. being a scaredy cat to <laughs> save his you know elderly <laughs> family for the most part. So spooky things happened. And a lot of the time when he was dealing with a situation, he'd go up to the attic and talk to his computer. He'd type in a question and the quest- and the computer would answer back to him in a very snark, kind of like, oh, you idiot kind of way, which is very much <laughs> like Siri, have we how today? And that was, yeah. that was generally just a prediction of how computers were. Um, the series is known for having lots of scares, lots of traumatizing, lots of children at the time. It was a show that I found quite frightening because they would only show it at nine o'clock at night. Yeah, they would. Which is the perfect time to show it. I mean, in theory, they probably should have shown it a bit earlier so that obviously the, the scariness would have faded by then. Yeah, but nope, nine but o'clock. <laughs> there's lots of very iconic characters, but I want to talk about a few that really kind of like styled with me, not just when I was a kid, but even today, I still find quite creepy in a lot of regards. So the first one I want to talk about is Cats. Oh yeah, Cats, yeah. The main reason why I don't like Cats, who he's, he's kind of like the counterpart to Courage in a sense, even in design yeah. as well. Cats didn't actually talk while moving his mouth which creeped me out <laughs> because he had this very monotone, weird voice. Like he was always malicious, but he never showed how malicious he actually was. Like he yeah. straight up wanted to kill people, but he never straight up was like that in certain sense. And he just, he was just weird. I didn't like that. And the fact that he was, there's one shot that kind of creeped me out. I think it's the first time you see him and it's when they go to the hotel that he oh, yeah. owns, yeah. I guess. And the owner's not there, but Katz is just sitting there like a normal cat, like wagging his tail 
And knowing what he's capable of, that's like that's kind of creepy. The fact that he's pretending to be a normal cat, cat. the fact that he's capable of just simply pretending to, to be, be a, a cat, cat. Yeah. which is obviously adds implications that like what he could have just pretended to be a cat, killed some people. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's heavily implied that he's off to people in that sense, which I didn't like him. I thought he was very creepy, and his voice was perfect. I can't remember the voice actor who played him, but he was great. Um, second character I want to talk about, obviously, Freaky Fred. Um, everything about Freaky Fred is creepy. I still to this day I don't understand of you you hear about certain episodes of certain animated series that got banned or they won't show on TV. I'm surprised this was an episode that never the Cartoon Network said no we can't show that again. Now I'm not trying to say it's the scariest episode or horrifying but it's just unnerving this whole episode because this is Muriel's like niece who's been in a mental asylum. And the reason he was put in there is because he has a weird obsession, almost a fetish with cutting people's hair. And he's a barber and he has like this creepy Joker-esque grin. And the whole episode is done in this, it's almost done in his perspective where he's just there. And he narrates the whole thing talking about the reason why he is kind of crazy and how he got there. Almost ending almost every sentence by saying the reason why it happened was because I'd been naughty. And that kind of stuff. And a lot of the... and. One thing that Courage was very good at was playing not um, not necessarily off-putting, but out-of-place music. Yeah. And one of the songs they play is like this weird children's like haunting like church choir music whenever Freaky Fred is doing something awful, and it's so disturbing and so yeah. off-putting. Just like what the hell? It's a really interesting episode, and some of the shots of Fred, him just sitting in the bathroom, just sitting there, just not moving very joker-esque like i said before uh one other character i want to mention as well obviously probably the most famous probably the most iconic episode scene character from all of courage king ramsey the man the myth the legend himself everyone knows the quote return the slab even i remember a couple years ago i went back and watched that episode when i was a little bit younger and even then i was like nah man we need to take a break this is a bit too creepy <laughs> Because for those of you who don't know, King Ramsey is essentially presented as a early kind of CGI mm. kind of character. And he's just standing there in the middle of this desolate, <laughs> fog-ridden place yeah. just saying, Return the slab," <laughs> And it's unsettling. And it looks weird as hell. And that's something Courage did very well was they, a lot of the scares were not in the same animation as Courage. Everyone knows about the you're not perfect scene or the girl playing the violin, which is still one of the worst things ever. <laughs> um, they did that a lot because they know that's how you make something scary is you make it look out of place. Um, he freaked me out as a kid. He freaked me out today. I still think he's very scary today because the animation has aged in a way where it looks strange. Like it looks unreal. It looks like the resurrected corpse of a Pharaoh King now, how it would look. And I think it's just done so perfectly. Like I said before, Courage is such a good series. And if I were to promote Courage one more time, if you have seen the series, I need to mention the fact that they actually did a special a little while ago. Um, they actually brought Courage back briefly for a CGI special oh, okay. um, called The Fog of Courage. Right. And it was really cool because it kind of... You think, oh, if they're going to make it all CGI, it's not going to be as scary. The main villain is this fog creature that is in like an active fog... But it kind of, it has, it's a fog, but then it has hands and it has a human face. Okay. And it's slowly approaching the house. Horrifying. Uh, especially because the, I think the actual face is actually a human's face. Right. <laughs> so it's even scarier because you know that's some guy's face. Much like the, um, the spirit of the blood festival. I don't know if you've seen that monster. It's like, it's literally a guy with a white face. Yeah. And what they did was they... It's, it's literally a, an actual guy speaking, but the top half of his face is like a picture. Oh, okay. So you get this really odd visual. It's like this pale white male face, a human talking, but then his face, the top half of his face stays stationary. It's weird. It's really creepy, but Courage is really good at doing stuff like that. You know, even some of the more subtle stuff like, um, I know most people know about the episode, The Mask, where it's like the woman who is in like the cloak and she's got like a mask on and she's very... Um, very disrespectful towards courage and that kind of stuff. Without spoiling an episode, it's, it's good stuff. Um, I've talked enough about the greatest cartoon ever made, being <laughs> Courage the Cowardly Dog. Um, Al, do you have uh, any characters you want to mention as well? Yes, I have two. So the first one is from a video game. Uh, 
I'm gonna say Nemesis. Nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> Evil Free. <coughs> um, I have a story behind it. Well, for me, the reason why I say Nemesis is because I actually. I didn't play the game, I think a couple of years ago I played the game, mm-hmm. and um, I remember buying the game, and I remember the shopkeeper, or the, ship, or the guy who served me, he was like, are you sure you want to buy this game? It's a scary game. I was like, no, that's fine, I want to buy it, because I want to collect the original Resi games. He's like, alright. I was like, yeah, there's nothing scary about this, what are you talking about? So I, bo- I booted the game up, and um, I decided to play it, I think I started to play it in normal mode, I can't remember if it was normal or hard mode. Mm-hmm. Um... And I remember I was, um, you know, start off playing the game, blah, blah, blah. And then literally, I think it's like the first time you actually see him. And then all he says is stars. And it's just the way he says it. And then he starts like chasing you. I was just like, oh God. And I think like I was running away from him. And then I got into like um, the save point. And then I just turned the game off. I was like, yeah, I'm not coming back to this. (laughs) And to this day, I still haven't gone back to the game. (laughs) A lot of people have that same experience i think a lot of people have said that the moment he i don't I don't know if it's the same thing but there's a point where you get to the police station yeah from the, you know the rpd from resident evil one and just randomly he breaks through the glass door through the window and he starts chasing you in the police station which scared a lot of people so badly because the whole police station is empty at that point yeah <clears throat> because obviously leon's been through and he's you know he's, he's cleared the whole place out and then he's just chasing you from that point on I am curious to see what your response would be to him in the remake. Sorry. Bless you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, no, yeah, I do want to play the remakes as well. I do want to go. I want to go for the originals first. Yeah, I think that's that's an interesting way because you'll have a really nice comparison piece to uh, uh, go through. But yeah, no, er- Nemesis makes a lot of sense. I mean, his design is horrible as well. Like, yeah, awful. Because um, yeah, because he's meant to be. He's a tyrant. Yeah. But he doesn't like any of the tyrants. He looks like something's gone wrong with a tyrant. Yeah. And something's like yeah. his no um, no organs are exposed or anything like that. Yeah. He's like almost like military like clad dressed. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like he's, yeah. He's got a purpose and that's to hunt you down, which is awful. And he's got like a fucking rocket launcher as well. Yeah. You know, you know he means business. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. And uh, who's your other character? The second character is. Um... Him from Powerpuff Girls. Him. <laughs> Fucking him. No, to be fair, that's understandable. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, him's... I, I don't know what to say yeah, about them. Yeah, gosh. He is... Oh, my days. Like, literally, like, when you first see him and he's just there sitting there with a massive grin on his face and he's literally got, like, freaking two voices. Yeah. And literally, he has, like, a... A normal, just gentle voice thinking he ain't gonna do no harm. And then when he gets angry, he's got, like, a really deep, demonic voice... And it's just the fact that they just have to call him him. Yeah. Would well, you know why they refer to him as him? No. Because in his introduction, you see him and he's in the bathtub or whatever. And the narrator goes, oh, no, don't tell me anyone but him. Yeah. So he, they deliberately yeah. remove his name because he's that terrifying yeah. as a villain. Even like the bit where he's <laughs> talking to the rubber duck. That is creepy yeah. as fuck. Because his voice is very high pitched. Yeah, at that point. really high pitched. And it's just like, yeah, it is creepy. Yeah. He, he's a character that I do wonder how he would work today. Yeah. Because I don't think, they, I know they reboot the Powerpuff Girls. They didn't bring him back. They tried to do their own villains, but those new villains weren't as strong. Yeah. And I mean, because obviously there is like a lot of implications with him as well because obviously the mm. name him you could perceive it to be a female character but he does have a beard yeah so you're not really sure what yeah like yeah. you don't know if it's like a him in a term of like that's all you can refer to them as yeah because i mean what are they i i always assume they were like some kind of demon or devil mm. um and it's odd because yeah when you really look at their design they've got like boots on heels yeah kind of like a dress. tights <laughs> they got crab claws yeah like they look like the devil or beelzebub whatever you want to call them yeah it's very odd like powerpuff girls went in hard with a lot of their villains like For they're sure. very iconic like him obviously mojo jojo is yeah. like a fucking classic um you got fuzzy lumpkins fuzzy lumpkins obviously you got the um for some, I was about to say the Get Fresh Crew. It's not the Get oh, Fresh Crew. Get Fresh Gang Green Gang. Gang Green Gang. Yeah. <laughs> get Fresh Crew. The Get Fresh Crew is an artist. That's why. I, I don't know why I said that. Um, oh, you have like the Amoeba Boys. Yeah, the Amoeba Boys. Um, um, and then you had, um, what is it? Princess? Princess. Um, yeah, yeah. I forget her I for- name. Yeah, I forgot her name as well. Yeah, Riding Rough Boys as well. Yeah. Um, lots of other icons. And then there was like some one-off characters as well um, that you had. like, um, And obviously you had like the fourth Powerpuff Girl as well. Bubbles. Not Bubbles. No, it wasn't Bubbles. It was um, 
I forget what they called the fourth Powerpuff Girls because there's there's a bit of a problem now because the reboot had another fourth Powerpuff Girls oh. to which people are like, no, no, that's not the fourth Powerpuff Girl um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I also do like the fan theory that, that the professor is Samurai Jack. <laughs> what? Because it's the same character design. Yeah, that's actually true. It's, the, it's the same. It's, it's the same. So people, people think that it's him because like, it, it's literally the same design. Granted, they were both made by different people. Yeah. Gindy Tarkovsky made um, Samurai Jack slash Dexter's Lab. Yeah. Meanwhile, um, Craig McCracken made Powerpuff Girls. So obviously they probably work together in that. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. <laughs> one thing that would be quite funny is... Um, do you know that one of the members from the uh, the gang Green Gang actually joined the band Gorillas briefly? No. Yeah, he did. Um, one of the gang Green members, I can't remember Ace. He joined uh, Gorillas briefly for oh, one of wow. the albums. Yeah, it's it's actually him from Powerpuff Girls. Oh my um, god! I'll have to show you a picture yeah, of him because yeah. he's got a slight redesign. But yeah, he joined and he was the bassist on the album The Now Now. Oh okay. And there is actually a reference to him in one of the music videos that he's featured in, where it says, "God save us from him." Oh, wow. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have to show me this. So you could podcast. say, yeah. I mean, granted, Gorillas and Powerpuff Girls technically exist in the same world because they've made reference to each other. Right. So you could say that him is an actual threat to the Gorillas and the Powerpuff Girls. Yeah, because I do get vibes, actually, from Gorillas sometimes. It does remind me of yeah. Powerpuff Girls a bit with they, the music. They went back and forth between yeah. referencing each other. Literally, ah, there's an episode of the Powerpuff sense. Girls where you see the Gorillas on a newspaper mm. and... Um, um, yeah, they've constantly referenced each other yeah. for whatever reason. But yeah, it's such a bizarre situation where you literally hear Damien Alban, lead singer and creative gorillas go, oh yeah, we've got Ace from the Powerpuff Girls. He's on loan. <laughs> <laughs> Which does make me wonder, are any of the gorillas characters actually ever going to appear in a newer version of Powerpuff Girls? I think that'd be really cool. Even if it's like a music themed episode. But uh, is that it for uh, characters that yeah. scared the hell out of us? Yes. My gosh. Um... <laughs> Some characters don't hit as hard as they used to. And um, I think that's a bit of a shame because I think there is a, this pretense where you can't make things too scary. Yeah, There's a few. Maybe we'll talk about newer, scarier characters that exist. Because um, there are a few out there, mainly in video games. Yeah. Um, particularly in Resident Evil. There's some awful stuff in Resident Evil in a good way. But um, I guess we will start to end this podcast with the video of the episode, which is going to be This is Halloween from The Nightmare Before Christmas. Now... Some people were wondering, why are you linking the very iconic and famous song from The Nightmare Before Christmas? And that is because The Nightmare Before Christmas turns 30 years old next month. Oh, wow. Yes, it is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Over in America, in some places, they're doing screenings and cinemas of it. They released a behind-the-scenes art book of it. This film is 30 years old. I didn't think it was that old. I thought it was at least over 20. My gosh, this film has not aged a day. And I wanted to kind of just reference that. I still think this opening shot, it's it's the beginning of the film, so it's not a spoiler, don't Mm. worry, um, just perfectly encapsulates everything about this film. And if you are someone who was very familiar with Nightmare Before Christmas, you're probably going, oh, it's a bit of a waste, you know, making a video episode. I've got you covered because in addition, I'm going to link you to a playlist of an album titled Nightmare Revisited which was a collection of songs that came out a couple years ago of different bands doing covers of the songs from Nightmare Before Christmas. And some of them are very interesting. You've got uh, the heavy metal rock band Korn doing a song, and you've got some other very experimental stuff just in there from artists from around the world. It isn't just mainstream people. So I'm going to link you with that. Um, Al, I want to thank you for being on this podcast. No worries. Thank you for helping me end the spooky season on a uh, high. And uh, anything else you want to uh, mention or talk about before we wrap things up? Oh, no, no, no. I'll be all right. No. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much going to be it. We've only got a few podcasts left before the end of the year. Oh, my well, God. I think How it's many? Four or five. Wow, it's gone quick. This In, year's gone quick. It has gone fortunately and unfortunately quick to yeah. some extent. But uh, obviously, we'll be doing the annual best and worst of the podcast coming very, very soon. I'm going to try and get that up for December twenty. 20- 25th almost said 24th there for a second um i think this is going to be maybe one of the more controversial end of the year podcasts based on what some people have told me based on their thoughts on certain things they've watched and seen and played i think it's going to be an interesting one uh because i've spoken to people and i've been like yeah i've loved that film and they're like i fucking hate that film and i'm like oh but they like that film so (laughs) 
<clears throat> it's going to be an interesting one, I think, but that's all to look forward to in the upcoming months. I want to thank you once again, Al, for being no on this episode. And I guess I will end this podcast like I always do by saying I was the Angry Raccoon. I'm the Indigenous Al. And we will see you on the next podcast.